welcome to Reflections on Music and Nature, everyone. I'm really excited about today's guest. Uh, Gabriela Elena Frank is a composer and pianist based in the Anderson Valley. Uh, she's not afraid of dealing with philosophical and ethical issues about the way we make music, uh, teach music, and perform it. Uh, the Washington Post named her as one of 35 most significant women composers in history and described her music as, quote, unselfconsciously masterful. I think I would agree with that assessment. Uh, she's regularly commissioned by some of the world's finest performers and ensembles, including Yo-Yo Ma, Boston Symphony, and Kronos Quartet, to name just a few. She currently runs the Gabriella Elena Frank Creative Music Academy, sorry, Creative Great. Academy of Music, which is in Boonville, California, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, thank you so much for, um, for ma making the time to do this. I'm really looking forward to talking with you. Well, it's nice to meet you, and, and thanks for reaching out. It's always nice to meet a kindred spirit while we're sheltered in like this. So absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I think I'll start by asking you just sort of a general question. What, what is the role? What do you see as being the role of nature in terms of your music and even your compositional process? So they're my dogs. So I'm going to um, go close some doors. And let my husband know I'm in this. Okay, hang on one no sec. No worries. All right, he he knows the drill. Okay, um, yeah, I've got my my wife back here too with the <laughs> watching my dog, so it's. <laughs> so the question was the role of nature uh, in my music. And your process <laughs> too, yeah. I mean that it's a it's a big question because. Um, as I've gotten older, so I turned 48 soon and I'm approaching the half century mark, which is really amazing to me because numbers don't mean much to me, um, but they do give me a sense of time and mortality and what I've achieved. But one of the things that has happened is that my music making has become more and more integrated into my personal life. And I think that when you're starting out Sometimes it's something that you spend a lot of time doing, but you're trying to make it feel real. Like I'm really a composer. This is who I am. I'm not just an imposter. I actually get work. I'm not embarrassed to say I compose for a living. You know, and you really embrace that because you personalized it. You're not trying to feel like something in a music history book, which is not you. And that's one of the reasons why it stays at a distance. So for me, part of that was the process of beginning to travel in Latin America when I was a grad student. And then I started to feel like a composer because I started finding things that I found myself witnessing. I felt like a witness and that I was putting it into my music. And just even having that framework of witness started to feel real. And the byproduct of that was composition. Rather than going at it, I'm a composer, what am I gonna say? <laughs> Looking around for, for material. So later on, the advent of a naturalistic landscape and my place on a planet began to come onto my radar. And I, you know, even as a kid, I can remember memories of just feeling totally at peace when I was out at Tilden Park in the East Bay. I loved summer camp, it was the favorite part of my childhood. And I could get dirty and I loved hikes and I loved the trees. And I remember sometimes taking out my hearing aids because I would see things differently. I, I would rely less on my hearing and my eyes just became really alive in some way. And, and that's pretty common when you cut off one sensory experience, others become heightened and rather quickly. So I remember maximizing my sense of nature by playing little games like that. But those were fleeting experiences and a lifestyle in nature wasn't really, a, I didn't allow for it until later. I was on the, the grad school track. I mean, I went from age five until almost 29 without taking a break, no, just summers off. And that's a pretty common route where we just go all the way to the doctor. So that's almost a quarter century of being a student. And that grind, unless you go to like UC Santa Cruz or some other universities that are really known, Humboldt State, that are really known for, uh, teaching outdoors or, I mean, it's not really going to be a lifestyle. Then I started gigging and I was gigging furiously. This, this life opened up to me, much to my 
surprise. So then I was spending a lot of time on planes and hotel rooms and urban, urban areas, urban cities. I can't really remember very many of these early gigs that were in even small towns in the, what we call the rural interface. What really did it for me was living in uh, Berkeley after grad school, uh, which is where I'm from, when I got sick. And I got sick out of the blue. I was actually diagnosed with the first stage the day after I defended my dissertation, which is like a horrible time to get sick. And you're supposed to be beginning your life, your doctor's in hand, you may even have some professional gigs going. Back then, the, the line was a little harder between grad school and professional life. Nowadays, you see undergrads that are composers and residents, and that's the, the change that came with the, the internet, when people could find you more easily. For better or for worse, there are challenges with that for young people, but also opportunities. But um, I really felt like I needed to springboard more my travels to Latin America and how that was going to play out in a professional and economically sustaining life. And all of that was challenged by this. So I kind of went back to the basics. I revisited my diet and I got rid of anything that, I ate pretty well, but I got rid of anything that wasn't organic. It started with that. And this was 20 years ago when eating organic was still kind of audacious, you know, that you're sourcing out farmers markets and that sort of thing. And I went vegan for a while. I tried raw food for a while. I started fermenting my own food. I mean, once you start going down that rabbit hole, you start reading all these sort of what we, you know, we was calling like fringe kinds of cultures around our relationship to food. And I just, there's so many wonderful documentaries that you can read and really charismatic, passionate people talking about this that were just as charismatic and passionate as any violinist I worked with. Any music historian really hyped up on what they were teaching. Any composer that was kind of crazy, they get that crazy look in their eye and you're like drinking the Kool-Aid. Yeah, your music's really great. And it's like this weird, gnarly, but awesome stuff. This whole other world, I felt like I was meeting kindred spirits that were changing our lives because of it. So I started doing things like I started learning how to make cheese and I was leasing a goat in Petaluma paying for its upkeep so I could get its lanolin and its um, milk and I was making products for myself instead of buying things and and then it became a lifestyle I really loved but was challenged by being on the road. So if I was maturing a cheese and I needed somebody to check in on it and I was on the road what was I going to do? So I started learning how to make cheese like Camembert and Brie instead that took six weeks and I would time it so that when I got home, it was maybe done. And that was like a welcome surprise for me. And, um, then there's an Institute of Urban Homesteading based out of Oakland. And I started taking a lot of their classes. You got a lot of funky, wonderful teachers all around the East Bay that are teaching how to have chickens in Oakland. And I had chickens, um, how to have a herd of goats in Oakland, how to have your own uh, quarter acre uh, food garden and edibles and I, I really just it was just a process over a number of years and I met other people so I didn't feel weird we don't feel weird when we're in the music school we're surrounded by all these other geeks and nerds that just talk about pitches and rhythms and, and multiphonics and we go talk to civilians and we're, they think we're kind of an odd bird it's like musicians have a hard time doing that you know and um I think it's one of, one of the challenges to do community engagement work is trying to explain what we do to people that know nothing. Uh, they're very smart and experienced and worldly. But so this was a really important uh, outlet for me personally in my personal life. I still hadn't really made a connection with music making itself other than trying to offset my lifestyle. So I would do things like uh, grow my vegetables, dehydrate, make my own ramen, my own veggie mix, and then take it with me on the road. Because all you need is like the hot water you get in the, the hot water boiler in the coffee room. And, and I could feel myself physically getting well as a result. You know? And this illness was a serious one. It lasted about seven years. Uh, I had an autoimmune disease that required a lot of surgeries and a lot of radiation. Um, and I had to figure out a way to ask people to fly me in maybe one day earlier so I could recover from the trip. 
and have that difficult conversation. You don't want to ever be a troublesome artist, especially when you're starting out. And one of the things we do at my academy is talk about how to have these talks now with employees. We were doing this before the pandemic about how to say, I'm not going to get on that plane. I can do this on, I didn't even know what Zoom was until a few months ago Same on here. Skype. <laughs> yeah, Skype or Google Hangouts. The world is transformed. So out of this crisis, we can find the wherewithal technologically, but also culturally to, um, to make these changes that are better for Mother Earth. Now, the pandemic is a symptom of environmental distress. There's plenty of evidence out there that on a warming planet, health epidemics are more likely to happen. So um, in my own music, this is a new path for me, and it's a recent path to begin com commenting on the climate crisis more directly. I am very blessed that I do enjoy a substantial career. And that means that I have the trust of major institutions and um, even a, a good platform. This is a fickle business. Uh, you never know who's in, who's out, or what to do. I know I'll be doing this work regardless of whether the big industry um, organizations are, are commissioning me or working with me or not. But it's, man, we've had our feet literally held to the fire for four straight brutal seasons here. And I live in Mendocino County now. And it is real. It is real. And I've begun to lose patience with climate deniers. And I personally feel that, yeah, we can keep cajoling and trying to make the case. And I think that's an important part of the battle. Meantime, we don't have, we can't be patients. Patients are going to be the death of us. And artists have a particular power to change minds. You look at writers like Upton Sinclair with The Jungle or Harriet Beecher Stowe with Uncle Tom's Cabin. And they push the movements of abolition and also reform for factory workers. And Upton Sinclair spoke to people's stomachs. They didn't want to hear that their meat had all these nasty things, you know, in it. And that actually led to legislation. They told stories that pulled at people. You look at the power of protest songs and how they've been really important in achieving rights. So there, there is a power there, and I have had people that maybe poo-pooed the Latin American presence in the Western Canada for whatever reason, um, but my music hit them first before their intellectual inhibitions could come in. And they came in saying, are you a militant, scary Latina? Or are we actually, can we actually be in this conversation together? And I'm very approachable, and I, I'm interested in people, and uh, I want to know what these things are. But I am a little less patient nowadays. And so I hope that this means that with future projects, I can address topics of the climate crisis with uh, more regularity. Like I said, this is, a, this is a recent development for me. And I'll be honest, I was kind of a casual environmentalist before this. I recycled and I composted and I was all about farm to table. I, think <laughs> a lot of us are, yeah. <laughs> I was a little trendified, but um, these fires are not funny and it has really transformed me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I totally agree with that. I, I mean, speaking of um, running out of patience and looking at things seriously, something that actually stuck out to me about the Academy was I was actually interested in this. Well, musicians can be very thoughtful people and they are. But I think something we avoid talking about a lot is like the question of flying, which is the most, the most difficult um, kind of issue I think that musicians face in terms of what they're doing on an ethical level. And I think a lot of people uh, just don't want to talk about it. And I was trying to sort of answer this question for myself about, about when we should fly and when we shouldn't fly. And I came across your climate commitment on the Academy website. And I found it really interesting and really um, admirable um, that, you know, you're, you're kind of aiming to go for something that's specific and, well, actually, let me just read a quote uh, from you here on the, on the website and then maybe have you talk about it if that, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a little quote here and I'll link it in the video description as well. It says, uh, 
The very interdependent nature of the musical life and our long-standing custom of listening to and conveying human stories will be our community's strength in navigating the elusive space between alarm and aspiration as we face the environmental crisis. It is indisputable that change is upon us, but we can be the stewards of that change if we dare to imagine and propose alternative actions, even if they eventually prove to be wrong, ineffective, or outdated. The point is to move, to act, and to be ready to discard what doesn't ready to discard what doesn't have a meaningful impact while demonstrating compassion towards one another. So I wonder if you could talk about, um, talk about the climate commitment and then maybe some of the specific things that you're trying to do. And I, and I, what I like about it too, is that, you know, you're kind of upfront about the fact that it's a, it's a process and it's a, it's an evolving thing that isn't going to be perfect at first, but the point is to just act. Right. Yeah. And that was important for us to, for me to psychologically move because musicians are used to being perfect. We hit that perfectly in tune. We don't write that dumb piece of music that's gonna get a public review. Everything's deep and profound and it's, it's gosh, we're all about demonstrating our ability and our, and, our, and our depth. So to step into a place that's really scary and vulnerable and um, subject to change as, as new knowledge comes up um, means let's just put it out there that we may discard these practices that we're being public about as, as not being that meaningful. But if we are unafraid to do that, maybe you can be too. And we can have a conversation about saying, you know what, that would have worked except you might have missed this one thing and um, change your fingering. I mean, use instrumental language and then that phrase will work for us. So that was the, that was first to unlock our imagination. And I think one of the things that happens when we, when we think about actions we can take as artists for a climate crisis, if we get paralyzed right off the, right off the, we just don't go there and we stop because it seems, first of all, insurmountable, what we would have to give up, like, don't take the gig. You can't fly there. What do you mean? Or, you know, talk about, uh, I'm not going to sign this these restriction clauses. Sometimes performers have to sign a clause saying they're not going to perform in another series within a hundred mile right. radius. Yeah. So that kind of thing um, forces you to fly from Boston to San Francisco to Oklahoma. I mean, it's a, it's a really uh, very eco unfriendly practice that's supposed to protect our work. Um, but actually all the restriction clauses in the world don't protect my work when I lose it for fire. So what we decided, what I decided to do was to say, I have two things I can use to model what a more eco-conscious lifestyle as a creative can look like. I have my life and I have the academy and I need to do it in both. So my husband and I have been talking about, we don't have children, so we have the luxury of being able to talk about, can we get a bio, fuel diesel van, a Mercedes biofuel diesel van, and there are more biofuel stations all through the country now. And if I want to make that one or two cross country trip, you can come with me, we'll load in our three dogs and we go and get somebody to watch our, our chickens and, and water our, our farm. Can we go and do this? And can I pick up work along the way? And then work coming back. And with enough lead time, maybe the pandemic is a perfect time to do that. There's lots of lead time to reset things. We schedule things and let people know this is when I'm going to be out there and this is when I'm going to come back. Now, admittedly, that's easier to do when you're established and have places to go. So, but we need to get started with somebody. And I've been able, I've been able to witness how my leverage that I have as somebody who's successful can help my composers who are not known. I can advocate for them. I can get them commissions. I can give them advice about how to, how to retool the conversation. Um, many of my commissions, I will say, okay, yeah, I would love to take this on. Can you also commission one of my composers on a package deal? And even if it's smaller, it's something. It's getting people's foot in the door. And then if I have a better eco-conscious agreement, then that composer gets it too. So we've got to bleed in. And people that are ostensibly leaders or have leverage, um, have thought about this, are living it, are in, are in good positions to get these conversations going. 
I also have sympathy for the other side of uh, when people think about the cost of making these changes. It's not that real to them, the cost of not. And the West Coast, unfortunately now Washington and Oregon, not just California, we are that canary in the coal mine. We really are. We're on the front line to the climate crisis. And four years running, it's not, it's not deniable anymore. So with the Academy, we um, zeroed in on the one act of flying as a really good one to look at because it's, it's remember when we put up this climate commitment, the pandemic hadn't hit yet. So doing things remotely uh, was, an, was a novel idea and one that people instantly dismissed saying, no, live is much better. And, and um, but I think what's really been interesting is for people to say, there are a lot of good things that have come from this. I can actually listen to these groups on the other side. There's a strange kind of intimacy and afterwards there's a Q&A with the audience and I can see every single person in the living room and it gives context to the questions. These Q&As, I'm so distant from the audience still when I'm up high on the stage, it's kind of intimidating. The symphony seats are still there. Yeah. Um, and it may be more intimate and achievement music setting, but it, it's, there are some good things to keep with us as we come out. So before um, we zeroed in not just on flying and reducing it, how were we going to maintain, not just maintain, deepen the level of commitment to our composers, pour more time into them? And we decided, you know, one thing we could experiment is having satellite uh, locations and using local and or semi-local musicians. We could pay people for their time to take the train in and uh, give them an extra 500 bucks a day and cover them in a nice hotel, but we would have to fundraise for that. It becomes more expensive, but then they give us more. They have to give us a few extra days of time uh, to make it worth their while. And if we have enough lead time, maybe we can even contact some local organizations say, hey, there's string quartets in town. You want to give them a gig? So everything becomes more meaningful. We might be looking at a lifestyle where performers are on the road for, say, two months of the year, like two times, one whole month each time, and then they're home for 10 months. But if we are getting away from flying and we don't have this mystique of the celebrity flying in people from Europe, you may actually pick up more of the local heroes, superheroes that can play anything that are nearby. And I, I think there's a deeper commitment to the community. There are many, many silver linings that can come out of this, but we can't get through that first wall of paralysis. And people's imaginations aren't enough sometimes to get through, but they gravitate to what they can see when something's modeled. So with that has been sort of the, the strategy of my academy from the beginning. First of all, we're ex very, very young. We just finished our third season. People think we've been around a little longer for the I, time. Me of too. I'm, I was surprised to see that you've been only around for three years. And I've actually, I've heard so much about it, you know, and I've had friends who've gone there and just like, yeah, that's making us, making a splash. It's, it's made a splash. And we were, I mean, I was strategic in the first year we did it. I didn't know if I would stick with that. I thought maybe I would hate it or I never want to see another Compose it again, or yeah, I'm never yeah. in my house. Really. Yeah, but then I loved it, and we went big with a website that had all a whole year of footage right off. We modeled it, and then we started getting this attention. So I'm hoping that if we can model a decarbonized way to make music, then we can then we can inspire others to go farther and go deeper than us. Right. So it seems like I mean, it's not only about it's not only about the real sort of you know, change that are being made that will have a, that will have a modest, but, you know, a meaningful impact on the environment, but all, but setting the example and, you know, kind of inspiring other people's imagination to do the same thing, to change the way of thinking, like you said, you know, and, and something that emphasizes like local musicians and some, and, you know, local people and letting, letting them shine, which is so different from the model now, like you said, of kind of an international model, which is, which is a good thing, but, you know, in a way it's becoming less sustainable. All the, many of these things you're saying, like, you know, emphasizing more local musicians and, you know, raising your own crops on your farm and making your own cheese, like all this stuff, it feels kind of old almost like it's a new thing, but it's, 
it seems like a more old way of living. So that, that's it's not even that old. And yeah, yeah, not the old. Industrialized way of living is only what three generations or something yeah, like yeah. that. For it's sure. actually we can't imagine because most of us are not that in it. Or to be honest, we there's still kind of a rural urban divide in terms of respect between yeah. the two cultures. Totally. Yeah, and I, I think some of that's changing. You have a lot of people, especially urban, that are moving into the rural areas, and um, that's certainly what's been happening here in Mendocino County. So it's beginning to get fuzzy in some parts of the country. But yeah, we're, we're looking at deep cultural changes. We, we need to do this quickly. And if we can normalize these changes to say, to show that life is not bad, when you adopt a way of life that's in harmony with the earth. I mean, look, I hope I live another 50 years. I'm determined to hit 100 because I want to live long enough to know what a green planet looks like when it is just normal for it. Just imagine how awesome when everything's green around us and sustainable wind power, solar power, we're eating really great, we're music making. Now, here's the thing. The climate crisis is tied to larger structures. And so you cannot address the climate without addressing racial inequality. And this growth oriented capitalist system, uh, I'm a capitalist, but I'm a friendly humane capitalist. I believe in money, but I also believe in a social net. And to not have some ethical boundaries for how far capitalism can, can push us, I think is what's leading to the climate crisis. And so, I want to see what that looks like because I don't really know. I have these sort of vague descriptions of friendly capitalism and I said, so, God, I need some policy makers that are young and green and making their own cheese and uh, in, a, in an ethical way. I mean, dairy can be ethical, but on a much smaller scale, while our music making has to go on a much grander scale. So these things are in inverse proportion. The artistic work is going to make the planet healthier. Yeah. Because that's the kind of activity that happens. It doesn't make that much sense in a capitalist system, but it does in a system that's about values and connection. So, you know, we're starting a uh, we're starting a climate curriculum at the academy, and just yesterday we announced our distance learning program with a bunch of really cool things that I'm I'm going to be signing up for. I designed it to be a lot of things that I'm not familiar with. So we have a punk music course being taught and we have one in hip hop and one in Carnatic Indian music. And then we have all these practicums for the composers. But from the performer's perspective, they're gonna break down pieces they think essential for every composer to know. And um, there's gonna be a special topics course that we'll do on the climate crisis for creatives. And I have an amazing climate scholar coming on board. It's not quite official official yet, so I can't say who he is, but he is as charismatic in his way of commuting, communicating as Ken Burns or Oliver Sacks, I, I think, and he's married to a violinist in a string quartet. And it is his belief that scientists have not been able to move the needle very much with all this wonderful data. We have all the science and technology we need. It's just a cultural shift that we, we just can't get there mentally, but artists, can do that. We're the magicians here. And we can't do it unless we are brave and start thinking about this, get past that paralysis, look at the larger context, because those are the larger context of families suffering in a, in a drought, there's a piece of music in that, is in the context, not necessarily in the data, that we're going to have the stories to tell. How did it affect you? Did fire affect you? What did it make you think about? But we also have the ability to imagine that green planet when I'm 100. And I'm telling people, you don't remember this, the fires were like this, you know? And we can tell those positive stories of where we need to go. And we have to do it in human ways that don't change us who we are. We can't try and be the climate activist who's a composer. You have to be Ryan, you have to be Gabriella, who's a humanist, yeah. who wants to tell these stories. That makes so much sense. I mean, yeah, I think, well, early maybe in the days of sort of like casual environmentalism <clears throat> that you mentioned, there's this idea of like, oh, I'm an environmentalist and I'm a composer and oh yeah, here I'll like write a piece kind of 
vaguely related to the environment and like that's enough but it's it's absolutely not enough and and like based on what a lot of what you're saying you know i feel like we need to it, we've been kind of having a lack of imagination and this pandemic happening has kind of forced us to think harder about our situation about capitalism about climate change about everything that's going on around us about democracy and just think like there must be something better and you know it's really cool to see yeah the academy you know, just taking a hack at it and and you know looking at things that could be better i'm actually scared to live another 50 years because <clears throat> i mean i'm i'm worried about the, about the future um what gives you hope right now because i because i i almost feel like i don't want to live 50 years that's to be honest that's my mm -hmm. feeling but i mean if i'm gonna go down i'm gonna go down swinging <laughs> totally totally i mean and i have felt that way since i was born i've been an underdog i'm, I'm a disabled latina part indigenous so it took more of the same to be honest sure. you know and um i i i it, yeah, it's not that different. It's more urgent because all these issues of racial identity and gender rights and, and disabled rights that were three specific issues pertinent to my life, nothing I've done means anything without a, without a healthy planet. The climate crisis comes first. And not only does it come first, it addresses all of these other issues. And so, you know, my husband and I was, were, we briefly talked about saying, okay, we're going to leave California. But then I was thinking, you know, but where would we go? The climate crisis is going to come to every corner. You know, where would we go? And we would just have to relocate again and relocate when we're older. And I was thinking very practically about this. And um, I've been blessed to make some money. And so we've used that money in our property to try and protect this slice of heaven and make sure that as much as we can that we're safe, which is thinning out the forest and putting on fire resistant materials. And so a couple of symphonies went into that instead of my retirement. So I got to work longer now <laughs> into my old age, whether it's composing or teaching. But um, the hope that I have, have drawn on has actually been from your generation. When I can't tell you how often since I put up this climate commitment random young musicians just reach out and say, can I Skype with you? Can I talk with you? And I can just see there, they almost don't need that much specific information. It's more like, am I crazy? Or there's this older person who's doing it, you know, and she's not going to live through the, the year, as many years of climate crisis as I am just by virtue of being several decades older. But then they see me outraged and going out there. And, and, and so then I see them get turned on and I think you feel more hopeful when you surround yourself with people that are digging deep to find it and are determined well I'm going to go down with dignity and swinging then and um, I'm going to model this and once I broke through my my um, kind of a creative block that I had for a few months after after our last election and I just was really down about a lot of things what I said you know what they already won the planet hasn't burned up, but I'm yeah. in it as if they, as if it has. And I don't want to be part of that story of people that gave up, that we actually could have turned the ship, even as things got worse. So I read the words of John Lewis or, you know, other greats that have passed on. And I'm like, oh my God, they've been through so much. And how many overeducated, disabled Latinas with a substantial symphony career do you know? How dare I walk away? at this point i have a lot of responsibility you as a you look like a white guy you've talked about your wife so you have all the privileges that come with that as well you've got things you can do with that i've got things i can do with that and suddenly privilege becomes a weapon but a, a weapon for peace a weapon for harmony a weapon for uh, what we need to do so it's a tricky balance and one of the things that, that will develop um, as a climate curriculum, not just in this weekend retreat that's up on the website, but as an ongoing curriculum for composers that come through, is what you've alluded to, which is hope in emotional health. Um, when I remember the moment when it finally hit me, it was the second season of Fire in 2018, when it was even worse than 2017. And I said, oh my God, we really did this to ourselves. 
we really effed ourselves. We really dirtied our planet. We really did this. Yeah. yeah, we did this. And I started grieving like some, like, like a close person had died. It felt exactly the same. You have to go through that. And it will be easier to balance it. You keep a journal, you start taking proactive steps. Um, you hold conversations like this, you normalize it and you start making changes. And I do have hope. It's amazing. Even with the fear, my husband and I were taking shifts through the night um, when the lightning strikes happened here to dry lightning storms. But I don't want to go down, but I'll go down swinging if I have to. And, um, and we can motivate one another. Yeah, I think that makes sense. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think there is hope. Um, so let's see, what else did I want to ask you about? Um, well, you grew up in, in uh, Berkeley, but you also, you know, obviously you, you have um, many diverse roots. Your, your father is uh, Lithuanian Jewish descent and your mother is Peruvian and Chinese ancestry. And you know, I know that your music kind of explores a lot of these things. So I wonder how important it is to you uh, to be in touch with, there's my dog, to be in touch with your uh, roots um, as an artist and as a human being. I know for you, those two things are really connected, um, the artist and, and sort of the human being. I mean, for me, it's actually a little bit of a personal question too, um, because I, you know, I, I am white, but my, um, but I'm also biracial too. So it's, so I'm interested in that, uh, aspect. Where are your people from? If you don't mind at, am I asking? Le Lebanon, Lebanon and Syria. Have you, um, I'm just curious, have you visited that part of the world? I visited Lebanon about 10 years ago. How did it feel? It was, I feel like I understood my dad a lot better. And I, um, yeah, it was a, it was a very priceless, amazing experience. I mean, my first trips to Peru were really difficult. It was not this magical homecoming that I expected, especially being treated as other all my life that I felt growing up that the national anthem that we would sing in the school wasn't really meant for me. I was a bystander of those whites for the white boy next to me. So I'm singing for him. And I always had a little bit of, you know, that's just not for me. I'm the poor orphan little cousin that just gets the scraps, but it's not really. And so I romanticized a lot of, of my mom's you know, motherland. And when I went, it didn't occur to me to get my Spanish good or to, um, you know, I couldn't eat the food. Everything was like, no, Gabriela, no, Gabriela. You can't eat that. You can't you get sick. And so I was sick from the food and the, I did get sick and I got sunburned from the sun. We're closer to the equator. So I'm like, ah, like this and, and I, you would get lost and understand the customs. And, but then you would have these experiences like nobody looked at me. I did not stick out anywhere. My stature, my body. And actually they looked at my Jewish hair and they looked at my glasses and thought I was from Lima that I had a perm and I could afford like, I was a rich, person, you know, Peruvian from, from the capital. And to see racism and, and, and racism and, and classism in another country made me look back on the U.S. in different ways. And like you, it made me understand my mom better. That what I saw my mother was like the, the tip of the iceberg. That I wasn't seeing her whole cultural identity. I would just see what could thrive in Berkeley. Yeah. And her humor and her perspectives. Um, and she began to change when she took these trips with me to see Peru through my eyes, but she was seeing Peru through adult eyes. I mean, there's so many layers of change between continents and over eras and over generation. And um, I, it was something that I had to put in my music. And a lot of my music came out sounding a little bit like a travelogue because everything was miraculous to me. Everything made my imagination dance. I just wanted to, I wasn't done with it, just looking at it in a museum in Peru or just eating that food. I, I had to go back and tussle with it some more with my chosen mode of expression, which has been music. Um, well, I remember when I started doing that, I turned down that job at Clark University where, where Lori San Martin was uh, teaching and she and I met there. We didn't know that we were both Berkeley High students at the same time when she was a senior and I was, as I was telling you, a lowly freshman. But 
I turned down that job after they offered it to me. I remember that email going, this is a pretty good first job. And I'm 29. I hadn't been diagnosed with my illness yet. 28, almost 29. And then this little voice was, you've only been to Peru once. <laughs> you know, you don't know anything. And, and, and I thought I was going to be a well-loved small time teacher, maybe somewhere at a small school because I was going to Peru. I was going to Latin America. I've been to Latin America a couple times through grad school, funding it mostly by myself. But nobody went to Peru for classical music. Everybody was going to Amsterdam and Vienna and Paris. So I thought it would mean that I wouldn't have a big career and the opposite happened, ironically. Um, and it made me realize that you have to be yourself. And you have to go where you're unsure. When artists go where they're unsure, they're gonna they're gonna create the answer. They're gonna be artistic and use wonderful artifice to find and create that answer. When you go where the model is there, it's done. It's like yeah. like another reality show. They all blend together. I cannot tell them any of them apart. So many. I love cooking shows. So many of them. So many another cooking competition. But if you're yourself. Yeah and you're patient, and you don't expect to like get the golden ticket right off the bat and hit a money commission right away. Um, at least that's how it's worked for me in exploring my heritage. And then you allow it to evolve and you allow yourself to say to audiences, I don't know what it means to be multicultural. I can't be the go-to voice for this, but I invite you to be on a journey with me as I continue to find out. My life is a continuous journey of trying to figure out what it means to be a mixed race mestiza, American born, that writes string cortex for a living. I think that's a very American phenomenon. To me, that's what, what's incredible about this country is that I don't think you would find that in Finland or, or other places, but the US you get to have those wondrous convergences of cultures and lineage, lineages that come together. So, there's a piece for you in about that, about Lebanon and about, are there tendrils that come into your life? Tendrils of your dad that come into your life? You can, you can do something with that because by telling that story, you're gonna hit millions of Americans. Yeah. There are millions of Americans that grew up with an immigrant as a parent and somebody else that wasn't, you know, a, a multicultural household. Um, millions of Americans may not present obviously like like you do I mean like I do but they may not present obviously like you do but do you carry this heritage what what is that experience like are they allowed to talk about it? I would love to know those answers from you and if you got the skill sets which is when all the training comes in you're gonna tell that story in such a vibrant way that presenters will build a program around the themes presented in your music. That's how a career gets going. That's how you solidify, you know, your a sustainable life. Yeah, and it's one of those things too that I think, I think a lot of, I mean, you know, everyone has these different experiences, but I think without, without talking about them and without addressing them, you, you don't realize that so many people have, so many people are also like you and have the same identity crisis things or have the same, you know, yeah, interests or yeah, type of. And to embrace it, to, to embrace, embrace it. to embrace this journey, to em and talk, talk about it, and to s not pretend you have answers. And sometimes there's pressure to have answers. Like a presenter wants a program note, or they want this, or they want you. And but you can actually talk about it very intelligently. Um, I don't have the answers, and I think I'm intelligent about what I'm talking about now. You know, and. Um, and you can normalize this. And to me, that's an act of citizenship, especially right now when the discourse is so raw about who's a good American and who's not. So um, composers have to do more than compose. We're witnesses. We really are. Learning that quickly, and, yeah. Yeah. And we can use our own life. Yeah. Um, let's see. Is there anything else that you wanted to say that I haven't asked you about or advice or thoughts? I mean, we've, we've covered, a lot of, covered a lot of ground here, but. I, I think um, musicians are blessed to be musicians. We need to look after our financial health a little bit better and to figure out 
those conversations are happening as we've seen how quickly the our freelance musicians you know just fell into crisis through the last few months and that's not acceptable um, but we also have to deepen our connection to the community the answer financial answers might lay there and but to believe that this music making endeavor is yours to shape yours to create and it's okay not to have answers but you have to move you have to try something and you have to get out of your way in terms of perfection as long as you don't like lose your ability to pay rent and just your basic safety go ahead and try things and and find trusted friends start small small is okay just high quality ethical you know with the best people and it, it will naturally grow and ripple and and uh, you'll you'll become more confident and then you'll demand more from your skill sets you really want to talk about climate change you better be able to orchestrate like nobody's business because that's like a high call you know imagine like a great piece uh, in terms of its ideals and then you don't remember that the clarinet stops at concert what you know i mean, totally agree i know exactly what you're saying totally agree yeah. With that. yeah and one can't be the crutch for the other the absence of the other so yeah. Great. Thank you so much. It's been so interesting and uh, inspiring to talk to you. Really appreciate the time. All right. Thank you for asking me. And thank you for doing this series. I think it's wonderful that you're doing it. You're getting the conversation out there. You are. Thanks.